Yoga isn't my only passion. I love old movies, musical theater, cheese, just to name a few. My guest today, Sarah Webb, also has multiple passions. She loves yoga, writing, collecting sea glass, hosting island retreats, and Sarah has found a way to unite all her loves and share them in service both on and off her mat. She's what I'd call a renaissance woman. I'm excited for you to meet her, so let's start now. So today, coming on in just a bit, is Sarah E. Webb, and we're going to be talking about how she learned how to unite her passion of writing and yoga together. She's an amazing human, and we'll get to meet her in a minute. She also, she's such an extraordinary teacher and leader in yoga, and she also does narrative medicine, which I had no idea. There's beautiful Sarah. I had no idea what narrative medicine is. She's a writer and a storyteller and so much more that we're going to dive into today with her in just a minute. Go ahead, Sarah, unmute yourself, show your video and hi, there she is. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for being here, Sarah, and sharing your time and your knowledge. And I am so grateful that you're here. I admire you as a human and as a yogi, as a writer, as just a a very insightful, knowledgeable, and sensitive woman. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, MJ, so much for having me here and Andrea for your help. And it's just, it's been a wonderful relationship we've had for a long period of time. And I just, it's really nourished me. So I appreciate again, you opening this space up for me to speak today. Great, thanks. Well, okay, now, so you've been able to unite your gifts of yoga and writing and and service so uniquely. So can you share with our listeners how you came to create such a multidisciplinary approach? Sure. I guess the big answer is I have absolutely no idea, except that (laughs) um, very organically in the sense that I've always been a writer. Even if I wasn't publishing my work, I've always been someone who's turned to writing as a um, a place to get to know myself a little bit better. And equally, I had the exact same experience when it came to yoga. And over a period of time, I made this sort of discovery that some of the things I really appreciated about writing and yoga were very much the same, that it was opening up a blank page or rolling out my yoga mat and sort of seeing what it was that came up on on that day and that given moment and making bigger connections in both of those arenas, but then allowing them to carry over into other areas of my life. And so as I thought about it, I was like, well, if I can do this, maybe someone else can too. And it really, really started during the pandemic in terms of how the two were united when we were all very separated. I got the idea of what would it be like to have some online writing and meditation sessions to both bring people together to share how they were feeling and to have that be united over, um, not necessarily, our shared experiences became more shared by doing something together and then listening to one another. Yeah, it's just what you say, because a lot of people hesitate from meditation because they can't turn their brain off, which no one ever can. That's not the purpose, but I think uniting those two, when you're trying to still your thoughts, that's when they usually become more active and then you have a place to put them. So I think that's a really great idea for people to really cherish or, or understand that thoughts are just thoughts and yeah. you can express them on paper or however you want to out loud. So, and also I want to talk a little bit about narrative medicine. So you are certified in narrative medicine from Columbia University. And this is very intriguing to me. I have no idea what it was. I do now because I've been, you know, (laughs) but I want you to tell people what, what is it? Tell us about it, please. I learned about narrative medicine a long time before I actually embarked and entered into the program. And I learned about it because I actually was sort of explaining about how it was that I like to work with people in in yoga um, through this act of of sort of telling a story as you were putting um, pieces together and allowing people to get to know themselves and their, their physicality a little bit more. And someone said, you know, there's this program called narrative medicine, which might be of interest to you. And what it really is, it's a practice of 
considering how creativity can hold a space for listening and conversation to become sort of like this bridge to something else, which is kind of what I think you were talking about in your video. And some of us have found when we enter into the, the yoga studio, you're taking one thing and putting it into another space and then allowing to see what comes up. But what it was really intended for was to draw upon the study of art and literature to enhance a physician's listening and observational skills. I think we've all had the experience when you go into a doctor's office and they seem to be only listening for symptoms. Like they don't really want to understand who you are holistically as a person. And so the program was actually really started or the practice to help doctors learn to be better um, listeners to their patients um, and to provide better care. So doctors would come together, they would read a poem that had nothing to do with medicine. And then they would use that poem to them with a writing prompt to sort of see what happened. And then everyone would listen to each other and you would discover we're all looking at the same thing, but it's opening up to something much larger. So it's very similar and different. It's using creativity to become a bridge to being better listeners of ourselves and to better listeners of the world. It's So it's not a clinical practice at all. It is frequently considered to be therapeutic, but it's not therapy. And again, it can be just sort of incorporated and assimilated in a lot of different areas in terms of different kinds of workshops, things like that. So that's what I've just finished my degree and I'm in the process of trying to set up more workshops using those skills specifically. That is so fascinating. And I wish it was required for all doctors because I know... <laughs> <laughs> to a doctor going, you're not listening to me, you know, and so gosh, that's, that's very, uh, I'm sure very useful and important. And so you, you have a program now called From Breath to Pen, and where you coach and you mentor, mentor students in the practice of writing and meditation. So for someone that has never meditated before, but feels like they're not a writer, or for someone that does meditate and never, you know, thought they were a writer, vice versa, or perhaps they, mm -hmm. they've never done either. They're like, how, how would that look for someone coming in going, well, I don't meditate and I don't write, or I love to meditate, but I don't want to write about it or vice versa. I write, but I, I don't want to stop and meditate. How would that look for us? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of similar to, you know, you hear people when they, they say they want to try yoga, but they're not flexible. Yes. Um, and so they can't do it. And so it's the same. It's like, well, fun fact, you know, that like, that's sort of why you're coming in to get to know yourself in a completely different way. I mean, it's the acknowledgement that meditation is really hard for everyone on a good day. But if you don't show up, you don't know what will evolve. And, and writing can be kind of the same way. I'm, I work with people differently on professional writing, but the kind of writing that we're doing in From Breath to Pen is usually very personal writing. It doesn't have to be shared at all. Um, a lot of it is the kind of thing uh, you hear Julia Margaret Cameron talking about morning pages, this idea of writing three pages when you wake up in the morning. And it's not about sort of writing your novel or writing whatever report. It's just sort of like pouring things out. What's going to come out? You might not even go back and read them at that moment, or you might look at them later. It's But it's very, very low stakes. It's simply the matter of showing up. And that's what I've tried, and then sort of seeing where it takes you. And, and that's sort of been my idea and my process. It's a commitment to showing up and seeing what happens and recognizing that writing can be as meditative as med meditation can be, be about writing, that all these different areas in our life are not necessarily compartmentalized. We hold all of them with inside of us. And it's that labeling. I think sometimes it happens in our lives where you're told you're this, but not that that can become problematic. So by it's the bring, bringing them together and uniting them to um, allow someone to feel more empowered in their voice in any space that they enter into. That's great. I always think, you know, that I hear it all the time. I can't do yoga because I, you know, can't, I'm not flexible. I've got this, I've got that. I got a bad back. I'm like, I'm like this, this is, these are all the reasons why yoga will help. So, right. but also there's been a kind of, I ask people, yoga teachers or wellness professionals, sometimes when people ask, what do you do? Sometimes I, when I say I teach yoga, then I sometimes get responses or I teach meditation or I teach writing or I teach whatever it is creatively. Sometimes there's a, 
oh, that's so great. It must be, no wonder you're so grounded and relaxed. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. A mess. Like, that's yoga. <laughs> I call my Matt, Dr. Matt. That's the only, <laughs> like, hi doctor, I'm here today. What can you do for me? So it, it's almost like I sometimes avoid it. Even when I say, oh, I, I, I'm a theater professional. What have you done? It's like, oh my God, I've busted my ass for decades, you know? So it's, I, I'm curious when you, when people ask you, what do you do? How, how would you answer that question? I'm still working on that MJ, but <laughs> I was going to back up for a second. I love the Dr. Matt because, you know, it, it's exact, that exactly is what I, I'm interested in doing. And rather than having something prescribed to you, it's sort of like learning to figure out your own, the, what it is that's prescriptive for yourself. That is, yeah, rather than that outsource, like you need this, you need that. It's a matter of like, what, what do I, what do I already know? I already have inside of me, and how can I allow that to develop? The phrase I have come up with that I feel really good about finally, and it's taken me a lifetime to get to this place, is I consider myself to be a teaching artist. That's my phrase that I've, that's my catch-all phrase that I've started using because I can't know one without the other. I'm as much as I'm, I'm a teacher, I am a student, and I use my create creativity in both places, and it just doesn't always look the same. I used to have a studio, a studio art practice, and then it's really evolved more into writing, and I don't see one of them as being more or less creative than the other. So teaching artists is how I describe myself. Feel free to take it if you want to use that. <laughs> I, it depends on the day. Some yeah. days say I'm a yoga teacher. Other days I'd say I'm a theater professional. Some days I just say I'm a human struggling like everybody <laughs> else. <laughs> so, and another very intriguing skill that you possess is ghost writing, where you write on behalf of your clients. I have to confess that when I visited your website and I learned more about how you help people express themselves when they can't find the words, and I thought, what an incredible service. And also, since you're a writer, every email that I've sent you, I've proofread, proofread like at least three to four times going, because Sarah's writing, your emails are like splendid. They're just lovely. Anyway, can you tell people like what kinds of things you can help with as far as your, your ghost writing goes? Yeah, I mean, ghostwriting really, like, really is just that. I mean, the, probably maybe the greatest example that's been getting a lot of press lately is, of course, I can't think of his name, but the guy who did the ghostwriting for Prince Harry's book, Spare. There's actually been some really wonderful essays that have been written about sort of like what that process is to write with someone. But a lot of it is, you know, listening to someone about what that is that they want to say, what's really important and then how to create it in a more universal, like in a, in a way that's reflective of their voice, to gets the point across, um, and that you know that there can be that kind of communication. The niche I have developed within this, which I've been really excited about, is I work with artists to help them work on their artist statements. Um, when you go to a gallery, frequently there's writing next to it, and so I've helped. I've been working with artists pretty specifically, and I actually just worked at the University of Rochester all year with a large group of students to help them find the words to convey and frame their creativity. So um, that's a niche area where I've been working with, but I work with people in all different ways. And some of it is way more sort of just nitty gritty professional to give them a slightly different tone in their voice on how, like their website, like how it is like, hi, I'm so-and-so and this is what I do. Um, so it doesn't sound like like a, well, a, when they, in the, the chatbot AI world, it doesn't sound like it was written by a robot and it invites the, re the, list, the reader closer. So that's sort of what ghostwriting it is. It looks different for, for different people. I've done a whole bunch of different things, but artist statements have become the niche that I've really enjoyed working on the most. And I think we are all athletes, whatever our career are, we have to be athletic in our mind, in our body, in our spirit. There's so that parallel. And that's what happens in yoga. You can parallel yoga with everything. It's so vast. And it's so personal and it's not, you know, at this point, it's not 20 year olds putting their leg behind their head. It's not, you know, it might've been that in your twenties or thirties where, you know, we're all like physically able to do this, but now it's like, don't even ask me to stand on my head. My neck is valuable. <laughs> so, 
I can teach you how to do it, but don't ask me to do it. It's so important to have these conversations and to welcome, it's never too late to start yoga or start meditating or start writing or, or start a risk. Like you said, just start a risk. So, and that's actually what this is too. I'm pretty fearless. And if I want to, if I have an idea, I'll do it. And believe me, I have failed many, many times and will fail again. And people have asked me, well, how are you so brave? I'm like, well, if I don't do it, I'll regret it. So for me now at this age, I don't want to live a regret. Time is ticking. And Sarah, I think you can relate to this a little bit about, you know, once you get in your fifties and sixties, like we are, you're like, oh my God, I got like, it's, it's going, it's going. So let's, I gotta, I gotta do what fills me, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I guess I just want to, yeah, like I love, you know, what what uh, Leslie was saying about success, you know, and I think of the word um, city, S-I-D-D-H-I, you know, which is success in yoga and how it does get redefined over time. Um, or, I mean, and I think sometimes some of those crazy athletic poses, which I still sometimes like to do, but some, when I first started doing them, that was all about ego. That wasn't about authenticity. And sort of how I've been rethinking things with this idea of rest, breath to pen. It's like, okay, how do I offer something that's a little bit more authentic um, to me and to hopefully to other people to contemplate at whatever age that you are to find your inner wisdom. And because the truth of the matter is, and I've said this a lot when I've taught yoga. So if you've been in my class, you've heard this before, whether you nail that handstand in class or you don't, I mean, the successes that you showed up and at the after class is over, everyone's life's going to continue on just as, as it was. It's not going to change your life. It's going to, it's just something you did in that moment. So how do we string together these little pearls and just trust that they're all supposed to be building together, that they don't have to be, we do have those pinnacle success moments of, you know, that we may understand as successes. And yet sometimes the greatest success is just how we choose to participate in the world. And that's what I've been trying to do in this project. That's the purpose of narrative medicine. It's just this deeper way of getting to know ourselves. Yes, thank you. You are 12 years sober, which is amazing. I never really know if I should say congratulations or I know that it's hard work for sure. And you're open to sharing about your journey. Mm -hmm. And my question is for you, can you share how you experienced your writing and your yoga teaching prior to your sobriety and how it's shifted now after 12 years. Yeah, thank you, MJ. Yeah, I, I think the big, the most significant way that I notice is if I think about it, my drinking and I wasn't the kind of drinker who had car crashes or big like like types of things that really were going wrong in their life. And for, I mean, any, most people who knew me did not know I had a problem with drinking, but what I would say about it is I was using my alcohol to self-medicate. I knew alcohol would work for me for a while, not forever, but there was a period of time in my life. If I wanted to feel better, I could drink and it would make everything feel bigger and brighter and equally when I tried to, I, I didn't want to feel something. I also could drink and stuff it all down. Like I used it in both ways. And what ultimately happened as my drinking progressed, because alcoholism is a progressive disease, I couldn't feel anything in either place. Everything was like going through the motions. And so it was just this great facade of like how things looked on the outside rather than how I felt on the inside, because I couldn't feel anything. And that is how I think it really, really changed as I got sober. It first was a matter of, you know, when you go into a room and you turn a light on and it takes a while like your, for your eyes to adjust, it was this slow awakening to um, a spectrum of feelings and knowing how I was feeling in different places and um, what I, and that feelings, as they say, feelings are not facts that like, you know, that feeling was going to come and that feeling was going to go. And so that's really, I think, what the greatest thing that I brought to both to yoga and to meditation and to writing that as I got sober, I became more willing to make mistakes. I became more willing to explore feelings that were bigger or smaller to just allow myself to keep going and to not be as fearful in either space. 
I don't know if that answers your question, but it's just about really learning to feel again and to trust my feelings. Yes, yes. And on that note, if any of our listeners are struggling with any type of addiction or unhealthy habits or kind of want to label it, you know, maybe it's even ourselves. What can you tell us one or two ways we could start to incorporate more love for ourselves? I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this. The- yeah, it really does start with it, it. It does. It does start with the 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 love, because I think a lot of our addictions come from places that we don't feel we feel less than about ourselves is just starting to really change to flip the story to change the narrative. I guess my greatest suggestion would be is because we can sit with these feelings for a long time. And and for myself personally, I lacked education. I thought an alcoholic was someone who lived under a bridge in New York City. I'm in the Bowery holding a brown paper bag. And that since I was a married married to a doctor with two children living across from Oak Hill Country Club in with a nice, very nice car um, in Pittsburgh, New York, that that couldn't be me. And it kept me pretty probably kept me pretty isolated for a long time. And so I guess going back to that sense of feelings, if something's not feeling right to you, there are wonderful places that we can get some education. And by actually starting to admit that what I was feeling, I didn't necessarily want to feel anymore. I wanted to understand the process. It allowed me to go into, for myself, I've done 12-step work. There's all different ways, but there's also 12-step work around anything related to any kind of recovery. The greatest gift was community. It was that sense of knowing that I was not alone and that there was no shame in what I was doing. I felt more shame. I have no problem calling myself an alcoholic now. Before I was, when I was actively drinking, it was the most shameful thing in the world. Right now I see it really it's it's a gift. It's turning your your scars into your into your your kleshas into lakshmis. It's like that sense of like turning your 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 scars, your wounds into your greatest gifts and learning from them. So I mean, I guess that would be like it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to talk to people. There are all different kinds of programs. There's all sorts of ways, particularly even online, to tap your toe into if you want to go into a meeting. But just be willing to, to talk to people would be, I would say, is the great is the greatest place that one can begin. Because really, any of these addictions begin with the fact that we have to identify ourselves. Like, like you have to be the one to say, no one, someone else calling you an alcoholic or calling you an anorexic or a whatever kind of word becomes more of a shaming quality, but it's the greatest gift and how we heal and recover is learning how to name ourselves and to own our names and then being allowing that to be part of the bedrock of healing. Thank you. And before we wrap up, uh, you lead retreats in beautiful Maine, Mohegan, Maine. Um, and my gosh, the, so it's a four, four day retreat four nights then and, and you do yoga and writing and you look for sea glass and it's can you explain it because it's just looks magical here's another picture of Mohegan go ahead and explain what you do in your retreat Mo- Mohegan is a tw- is a tiny little island year-round island community off the coast of Maine which I have been going to since 2005 and um, there's, I can't explain anything. There's, it's actually a vortex like uh, Sedona is. Like, I mean, there's actually powerful healing energy there, but it's, there's something very magical about getting on a boat and letting your whole world drop away as you're taking an hour boat ride out to the islands. It's just a place where I've gotten to know myself and what I want. And I began offering this experience a couple of years ago in small groups, really around eight to nine women. We use a book as sort of to create like an embodied book group. The book that we use um, this year is called When Women Were Birds, 54 Reflections on Voice. And it's really, it's a story about how a woman got to know herself and her mother through her voice. We use that as a way to, I pull exercises and prompts from a very, very individualized based upon the people who are there. And we really work and we are on the island. We take a part of island activities. We take um, silent meditation walks in the woods. We read and we write and we eat lobster and we have lots of fun and do some restorative yoga. There's time for yourself and there's time to meet some really wonderful and also equally eccentric people that you would never meet who live on this island all year who welcome you and want you to know a little bit more about their world. And it's just, it's a really powerful experience. It's, I can't really 
explain it that much more other than you should come once in a lifetime experience. Even if you can't come on retreat, you should have an experience of going to, I recommend you go to experience of going to like a kind of a remote place and, and just welcoming yourself there and seeing what comes up. So yeah, the retreat this year is September 22nd through 26th. And so it's in the fall, which is the most beautiful time. It's still warm. There are very few tourists. You have the island to yourself, so which is even better, in my opinion. I sync it up with uh, bird migration. So you can, we get to spend some big bird migration spots. So you can do some birding if that is of interest to you. But it's time really to turn the retreat into what it is and what you need. For people here who are on this call or are watching the recording, I have a couple of spaces left and I wanted to add a little a uh, little nugget of incentive to take, um, I will take $50 off the cost of the total retreat, which is basically like including your boat. Otherwise, you're, you would pay for your own boat ride to come out to the island and then everything else is covered. But that's sort of like the equivalent of like, and I'll pay for your boat to get there as well. So. Awesome. I like that. I'll pay for your boat. That's <laughs> I'll get you there. <laughs> then yeah, the rest is up to you. I want to thank you again so much for doing this. We appreciate all of your participation. And this series is an experiment, like I said, and I'm, I'm hoping to bring together these, you know, youthful older yogis, but you don't have to be a yogi. <laughs> I mean, you just have to be a human. <laughs> so um, we do talk about yoga because most of us are yoga or wellness professionals, but that does not mean um, that you have to do yoga to participate. One last thing before we go, which is so awesome. Sarah, you just wrote a article and it's on your Substack, Narrative Threads Substack, and it's called Martha, Martha, Martha. You must all read it because it is fantastic. So Sarah turned 57 the same week that Martha Stewart was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. It's a lovely piece. It's fantastic. We, we put the Narrative Threads onto that. And one last thing, Sarah, what, what prompted you to start to write that? Oh, I, I just, I mean, it, it really, I've thought the thought about Martha Stewart for many years is, is if you read through it, you'll sort of see it's just, and I never really, I never really thought of her as a sports illustrated model, but I was just like, of course, this is going to happen, you know, like at this moment. And, um, I just, I'm, I'm really interested as I get older, I feel more beautiful and stronger in my body all the time. And it, it is so much less about standards. And equally, I recognize like all the places those standards held me hostage for such a long time. And so I just, it just came out of me and particularly as being a part of this wonderful series. Thank you again, MJ, about being the youthful older yogi that oh. I can any way we want. That's right. Thank you. Thank you all. Again, next week, uh, if you want to join us, we're going to be having Terry Orr from Rochester. She is a nutritionist, yoga teacher. We're going to talk about nourishment, body and soul with food and yoga. And also a student and very dear friend of mine, Sherry Simpson, will be on next week. So uh, next Saturday. So thank you all again, Sarah. Um, namaste. Thank you. I appreciate you, cherish you, and I'm very grateful to you. So Thank you all for tuning in and thanks so much for listening. You can find me and subscribe for more youthful and healthy information on my website, shareyogawithmj.offeringtree.com. Or if you know how to navigate social media, find me on Facebook slash Mary Jane Waddell. That's Jane with a Y, J-A-Y-N-E. And Instagram at Mary Jane Waddell. Remember, Jane with a Y. Now, this podcast would not be possible without my youthful, older producer, editor, and creative friend, Andrea Canny. And you can find Andrea at Andrea Canny, that's C-A-N-N-Y, dot com. And of course, thanks to my generous guests who've shared their time and youthful wisdom. Remember, the Youthful Older Yogi podcast is presented solely for educational, inspirational and entertainment purposes it's not intended as a substitute for a physician or other qualified professionals okay yogis stay well and stay useful